Thank you for joining. This is the OpenGovCon track. And uh, again, once again, excited to introduce these two gentlemen with a really uh, fascinating topic. So we have Jeffrey here uh, from the IBM team as the WW Program Director. And then we have Arno, uh, who is the senior technical staff member with IBM. And they're going to walk us through navigating the open source and open standards for better cybersecurity. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, I'd like to uh, start this session uh, just by mixing it up a little bit. Um, both Arno and I have been very active in the uh, OpenSSF, but this is more of a broader topic. It's 2023. Why is cybersecurity so hard? And uh, it's more than just the tech. It's, if we can go to the next slide, uh, this is a study that I came across uh, a little over a year ago now from the MIT Management Sloan School. And it talks about this concept of the fact that cybersecurity and compliance uh, and the regulatory aspects of it, you know, you feel that they're kind of like peanut butter and jelly, that they go together really well. But they really are driven by two different forces. The in fact, is that compliance is primarily driven by the enforcement risk. So your organization doesn't want to end up in jail or doesn't want to be on the wrong side of the law. But cybersecurity is driven really by the business risk. You don't want to get ripped off. You don't want to have your brand image damaged by having a bad malware or ransomware attack. And because of those two uh, issues are driven by different factors, stakeholders uh, are really, there's a lot of them. And they all have a different point of view as to what's really important, whether it's the legal group, the leadership team, the security professionals. And you can end up being compliant. In other words, you're on the right side of the law, but you're not going to be very secure. Or alternatively, you can be really fairly well locked down, but you're not compliant from a regulatory perspective. And so it can be very hard to find that right mix. And you can result with the gears just aren't meshing well. You can end up with um, a lack of culture around how to get the right balance, uh, difficulty in developing and implementing the right set of regu regulations that are important to your industry. And at the end of the day, the cyber world is moving too fast to keep up. So with that as sort of a high level entry point, traditional cybersecurity needs to evolve. And I feel a lot of uh, pressure because I've got Krob here right in the front row to make sure I'm on target. But cybersecurity, 66% of security teams do not share their data. And now I'm not talking so much on the supply side, is more on the analyst side of the equation. 45% of security teams require security engineers to hardwire integrations. And this is really challenging, and this is part of the reason why cybersecurity professionals struggle. So we need more cooperation. And in this survey done by ESG Research back in mid-22, 84% believe that a product's integration capabilities are important. Why is that? Because in this space, there are a lot of point solutions. And it can be very difficult for an analyst to assemble and adequately understand what's going on. 83% believe future interoperability depends upon established standards. Who's going to establish those? So what we really need to move towards is a connected and open analyst experience, one that helps uh, with a better user interface, one that shares data, one that allows community-led innovation expertise. It's starting to sound like open source? I think so. Open standards and improved operability. So these are the four pillars of open security from a IBM and from others in the industry perspective. Open security standards, uh, open source code to allow innovation and quickly fix gaps in the IT ecosystem, whether it's commercial gaps or community gaps, et cetera, intelligence and analytics, and best practices. 
and it's, we're not there yet, but we're moving along this arc of an open security journey to a collective defense. So as you can see on the uh, left side of the screen there, improving risk reduction and a collective defense will move up this uh, ladder of foundational standards, operational standards and compliance, threat intelligence sharing, and collective defense. So as much as we're in a challenging time from an open source software security perspective, uh, I think that the way we need to change as a community is aligning well with the way cybersecurity experts need to evolve along with the commercial and other players in the industry. So IBM is active in this open cybersecurity Alliance. It's a governed as a OASIS open source project. And it's an opportunity for the industry to come together to support open cybersecurity uh, ecosystem where products freely exchange information, insight, analytics, and orchestrated processes. The challenge is again that OASIS comes at this from more of a standards organization perspective. And if you think about what's changed in the industry, um, go back only about 10 years, standards bodies really dominated the landscape. And open source was a thing, but it was really still all about standards. And standards are great, but they're largely driven by specifications. They largely take quite a bit of time and so what's happened over the last, again, seven, eight plus years is that there's been this rapid shift towards a dominance of the impact of open source software. And I don't have to preach to the choir here. You all know why. Open source software is much more frictionless. And so in this new era, the pendulum is going to need to swing back because right now we're kind of 80% open source, and yeah, standards are still important. But I'm not gonna steal my partner's thunder. The last thing I wanna to touch on, though, is that this nonprofit cyber alliance is also dedicated to trying to help fix this. And you can see that the Open Cybersecurity Alliance is down there listed uh, as one of the members of this. OWASP is also here, and this is a larger umbrella initiative of not-for-profits that see a similar problem and want to see this effectively addressed. So with that, I'm gonna step back and have Arno take us through the next section. So talking about government and, and standards and open source, I mean, it must have occurred to you that you know there's more and more activities going on. Essentially what we have, right? Software is under attack and open source is part of it. Open source is used in every software now. And, uh, you know, bad actors have discovered that there is kind of a soft spot right now on open source because we haven't always used best practices and, you know, in all open source uh, software development. And so what we are seeing is there is clearly a movement across the board around the world, right? With different governments stepping up and saying, okay, industry, this is enough. And I mean, there is good reason for it, right? It's costing a lot of money. First of all, it's impacting economies around the world more and more. We have this, you know, cyber security issues that come up. But in fact, it even leads to public safety issues, right? We have critical infrastructure that are being, you know, put in danger. When you think about, you know, security, you don't necessarily think public safety per se. But in fact, when you think about, you know, your house has more and more devices that are plugged into software, which, you know, we hear these stories of like baby monitors, for instance, where people are hacking. This becomes a public safety issue. So it's not surprise that governments are saying, okay, enough, we need to get this under control. So in the US, we have seen uh, uh, several executive orders being published now that are trying to push you know, the industry to act. And of course, they have a huge leverage because essentially they are going to say, these are the requirements that 
industry must meet for us to buy your products, to buy your offerings. And this is going to lead the whole industry to follow suit because, you know, all our customers are going to say, well, if it's good for the government, it's good for me as well. I want the same kind of guarantees regarding security. So uh, the first one, the executive order from 2021, uh, I, you know, tries to push the envelope in, in setting some requirements about cloud offering specifically, but also get into as bombs saying, well, you know, one major problem we have, we, we don't even know what's in those software that you're selling us. So that's, you know, what we want to know now, what's in it. And that will be the first step towards understanding what the security vulnerabilities might uh, impact or, uh, the, the software we use. And so there is a series of those regulations coming up. In Europe especially, we, we see that now there is the CRA. It's been, you know, it's being currently discussed quite broadly because there is definitely some impact that could uh, even touch the open source wo uh, uh, world. And, um, and it's true, this is just, this is not exhaustive, right? This list, it ends with Japan, but we, you, you see similar activities all around the world. Is so, there any, anyone in the audience who doesn't know what an S-bomb is yet? <laughs> yeah, right. You get a sticker for Crub, that. of all people, crub for sure. So as Arno continues, keep your, start to formulate some of your questions. Questions get stickers. Ooh incentives goodies no but so i think everybody kind of knows what the nest bomb is at this point right it's the bill of material it's a concept that exists in other industries the it industry just never got to do this and now i mean we see it you know i think every company every time there is some you know uh, um, as a cve that gets published the first problem is well where does that impact us right because often vendors i don't think i'll you know I'm divulging very big secrets there. Even vendors often don't know what they are using. We have all developers that are using all sorts of open source software, and we don't necessarily have a full understanding of what ends up in our products. And so SBOM is a way to try to address this problem by clearly listing all the content of the, of the software. And so there are different activities in this space. There are different formats being, pub, uh, being developed. Cyclone DX and SPDX are the main ones. There are others actually, but the, what? <laughs> yeah, that's yesterday's news. Come on, oops, sorry. Sweet so for fans. those who are online, <laughs> Rob said Swede. And uh, that's why I said I wanted to acknowledge there are others, but clearly, you know, these are the most dominant ones or the leading ones, uh, Cyclone DX and SPDX. And, and this is very, you know, quickly evolving because they started with this idea of, you know, basically listing the components that are in a piece of software. And typically, you know, in the case of SPDX, there was a focus on licenses, for instance, what kind of licenses were into these products. And, and it's quickly evolving with all the dependencies. And now they are also trying to capture what you know the build environment that was involved in 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 generating the code or the, the the actual artifact and so on so open ssf you probably have heard of it open ssf is a you know part of the linux foundation uh, i don't know if some of you may have attended the open ssf day yesterday that was fully focused on this uh, as jeff was saying earlier he and I both active in OpenSSF. OpenSSF started actually quite a while ago in 2020. At the time though, uh, we were in the COVID time when company was a bit shy, were a bit shy about spending a lot of money. We didn't know how much you know, it was going to impact the economy. And so there was very little resources put towards this project, even though there was a recognition that there was a need for the industry. This is bigger than any single company, right? So we have to have a movement at the industry level to try to have a chance to address this problem. And so this OpenSSF was created with basically the mission of looking into this problem and collaboratively trying to address it, facilitate, you know, addressing the issue, increasing the security posture of all open source software. 
Which and, is, of course, a big task. And just as you transition to the next slide, I just want to make the point for the audience online. It's not that we're saying open source software is more or less secure than proprietary software. Open source is not the problem, it's part of the solution. But open source has become so massive in its use in the software supply chain that it's become an attractive attack surface. And that is why this is the right time to begin to address this. So OpenSSF went through some what of a reboot in, in December 2021, where we basically, the company said, okay, now we are ready to invest more broadly. And so the, the activity became fully funded. That's when I personally got involved in it, Jeff probably at the same time around. And so we've been involved in this since then. From a regulatory point of view, going back to what I was talking about, so the EU is, you know, has been leading the charge in many ways on that front. There's been several acts that have been, you know, uh, been produced by the European Union over the years. They started several years ago in 2016. Uh, they had the uh, first uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, act for uh, critical infrastructure. And they have been going on, uh, on that path since then with the Cybersecurity Cyber Act. And then more recently, you know, we've heard of this CRA. I will talk a little bit more about that. But they also had one regarding uh, wireless devices and communication in general. You have to understand a little bit how EU functions, right? Uh, there is a legislative framework that was put in place where essentially it functions in two different levels. There is at a first level from a legislative point of view, the parliament is going to issue an act that defines some kind of requirements, things that they feel need to be meet, met to, 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 to ensure uh, the, the security. Then at the lower level, the European Commission, once the act has been uh, enacted by the parliament, they, they will actually ask the commission to implement it. And the way the commission implements it is by turning to standards bodies to define standards that will implement the, and, you know, the, define how the requirements are actually going to be met, practically speaking. So it's a multi-level process. And typically, uh, we, they will end up with some European standards that there are three main uh, organizations recognized by the European. It's Sensenelec and Etsy. Sensenelec are initially two different organizations, but actually you'll have, have, you, you will never hear basically one or the other <laughs> independently. They always come together, Sensenelec. So it sounds like there are only two organizations. Those organizations function as part of you know, the whole uh, a spectrum of de jure organization. These are like formal organization along with ISO, IEC, and ITU, which are at the international level. In the process, they will consider adopting international standards that will help them meet those standards. But if it doesn't work, they may issue European specific standards. Of course, vendors like IBM and others that have a global market have an interest in trying to minimize things that are regional specific. So we engage to make sure that as much as possible, the standards that are being adopted are as international as possible. There's also you know, many different organizations that are not de jure standards like Directory Oasis and others. We've actually been working with the European uh, uh, you know, Commission to get them to acknowledge the existence of those standards organization and not necessarily require every one of those standards to go through the ISO process to, to make it you know, usable at the European level. If you look at the CRA in particular, because it's a big topic right now, what's going on again is these two layers that I was referring to. We, for now, we are still in the pro legislative process where they are defining the CRA. It's actually fairly late in the phase now of development where they have defini defined already all the requirements and they are in the very final phase. But in fact, this is only the beginning of the process because 
once the legislative process ends and the parliament issues the, the act, they will then again turn to the European Commission to kick off the technical process, which will be this, okay, this process of how do we actually go at implementing this? And there will be another, you know, uh, 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 possibly of negotiating here. In practice, you know, it's supposed to implement the requirements. There is some leeway in how this gets done because, you know, it's like the first part, the first layer is done by a uh, politician. The second is by technical people. And so then there is, you know, some room for appreciation as to how the two, you know, uh, match. So looking at IBM more specifically, what do you actually do in that space, right? So first, I mean, we actually have a, a policy blog on supply chain security and open source. You have a, you have a QR code there you can scan to get directly to it. Um, we, you know, from an IBM point of view, <laughs> you recognize me. Um, so we actually support open source community security initiatives. This is something we do across the board, not just in OpenSSF. We're involved in different organization. Um, you, uh, you know, we support the, the bill of material, <laughs> software bill of material. You can learn about it. And uh, we are, uh, we are uh, supporting improving security execution, right? And, and contributing to open source project overall. And I just want to add to that point that from an SBOM perspective, uh, right now what we feel that everyone should be doing is getting their hands dirty, metaphorically speaking, right? Now is not the time to just be generating SBOMs and because I, I, I heard I had to do it, I went and bought a point product and now I can and now I'm going to pass them around like trading cards not a recommended approach, right? You need to be using and developing your skill as a, and let's face it, we're all software development companies to varying degrees today, right? In this age of digitalization, um, you've got to have strong skills in this space. So right now, you should be developing those skills internally and using that learning to understand where the problems are in your own software supply chain. And the other point I want to emphasize that Arno touched on is that if you are a smaller business or a mid-sized organization and you don't feel you can support uh, the open source projects that you're consuming, at least think of sourcing that code from a vendor who does, like a MongoDB or a SLES or a Red Hat, right? Um, that's another way you can help uh, to s ensure that the ecosystem is going to improve. So again, you know, we are very much involved in OpenSSF and, and you know, uh, this is a way to show uh, some of, you know, it's kind of bragging rights, <laughs> you know, the, to, 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 you know, um, sh show the, the level of involvement we have. We actually have, how many people do we have involved in OpenSSF total? This is just a short, uh, you know, uh, segment of, how well, many people we I, 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 I think you, you said bragging rights. I, I, I think you mispronounced proud leadership. Um, we have Jamie Thomas, who's a general manager within IBM, who is a very busy person, but is dedicating a significant portion of her time to serve on the governing board. And uh, she's proud to be there with a lot of other leading firms like uh, YPRO and AWS, Microsoft, Google. There's a whole list. You can check it out on the website. I myself am chair of the governance committee. We're trying to help ensure that there's proper structure without becoming bureaucratic. And Arno, he's being modest, but he was just elected along with Krob. Uh, Krob's the chair of the TAC and, and Arno's the vice chair. So um, we're excited to help. Yeah. So we, we don't just participate in the governance and helping OpenSSF be successful. I mean, this is essentially what we're trying to do is since we're invested in this, we want the organization to be as successful as possible. And, but we actually also contribute to some of the activities 
And this is actual code contribution that we have made in that space. Uh, we've made contribution of a license scanner to OWASP. Um, we, we act, this is something that actually we used internally. So we can actually scan code and recognize different licenses. And we contributed that to OWASP. And uh, we have also an SBOM utility. You know, of course, a lot of focus is on SBOM again, but you know, there is actually a lot of code out there that generate SBOM that are completely broken. So we need to also have tools that help us, uh, you know, validate SBOM just first at the format level, and then eventually try to go a bit beyond that, try to understand the semantic aspect of the information, ensuring that it actually is valid also at that level. Uh, and, and the tool actually, one of our colleagues is working on this, uh, Matt uh, Rakowski, and uh, he is trying to do things like being able to show the difference between two versions of an SBOM, because SBOM are going to be huge Typically, you know, they contain a lot of data, even if it's technically human readable, practically it's not. <laughs> Krub is laughing, you know what I'm talking about. And so you need tools that will help us, you know, try to, to, to manipulate this data. And so is working on a diff that will help you uh, see what has changed from an SBOM to another. So when you go to, from a version to another. We also have uh, made some contribution to uh, Scorecard, which is a program developed as part of OpenSSF, which basically runs a bunch of tests against uh, an open source project or repository, and it will, you know, uh, give you some notion of how secure it is based on a whole bunch of different criteria. And not just the code, it's not just trying to find vulnerabilities, it's more about, you know, the policies, how the, the, the the open source project is governed? Do you have like, you know, peer reviews that are being enforced and things like this? And uh, we have actually worked, uh, again, trying to, uh, we are interested in being able to see the evolution of the, sc the scorecard between different versions, for instance. And then <clears throat> there is another thing that's coming out of IBM research you know, why we are focusing very much on this S-bomb that typically tries to, you know, pass the, the source code and try to understand all the dependencies out of passing the source code. They took a different approach, which is to actually look at the actual binaries and basically come up with very smart technology to have a very fine footprint or fingerprint of the code that's running. So they can actually recognize different components and be able to have a digital signature of a program. And so there's a talk about this at 6 p.m. today. And if you want to know more, it's really fascinating. I encourage you to go attend this session. Yeah, our, our colleagues out of research, their propellers spin pretty darn quickly. So I highly recommend that 6 p.m. slot if you can get there. Um, so. Uh, we've, I think we've a pretty compelling story between myself and Arnaud. Uh, I wanted to return to these four uh, silos associated with open security standards. They remain important. They're going to become even more important, and they're going to um, sprout more teeth than they currently have. So we all collectively need to be engaged and paying attention. Uh, open source code. Uh, this is a great opportunity. I, I talked earlier about how early 10 years ago it was all about standards, and then now the pendulum has swung where it's largely dominated by open source. Uh, we're going to see the pendulum swing to some new equilibrium. I'm not going to predict where it's going to land, but this is a huge opportunity for the open source community and standards organizations to more proactively figure out how to effectively work well together. Um, Open source projects don't need to become, you know, standard specialists per se, and standards organizations can't develop software development capabilities at the drop of a hat. So we need each other. And then with better intelligence and analytics and best practices, we can really help get our arms around what is a significant problem. And lastly, for the folks uh, here in the room and out uh, on the web, we've got some recommendations about you know, what can you do to get started in this space? 
I mentioned the Open uh, Cybersecurity Alliance early on. I uh, would really recommend that if you're industry, in the industry, check that out. Um, CISA is actively op uh, holding open calls. And again, that's not for everyone, but if you're interested in that space and you've got a way to contribute, go check it out. Uh, in the Open SSF, we have some uh, great best practices guides that Krob has done some great cat herding to put together some valuable information. Definitely want to recommend that. At IBM, we have an IBM security community and you can figure out what we're trying to do to try and, again, break down silos and develop better execution against this. And then, as another proof point, our last link in this is just from a week ago. And the federal government, if you hadn't caught it yet, has issued a paper that's basically doubling down on their perspective on the importance of standards in not just the federal government on a national level, but on an international level as well. And if you think about it, it's kind of like analogous to the post-World War II era where the US invested in the rest of the world with the Marshall Plan and other ways of helping to reach out and establish infrastructure across the globe that improved the human condition. And in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of sort of turning inward in the part of the U.S. administration. Uh, well, the uh, current administration is basically planting a flag back into the space saying, I be, uh, the, the company, country needs to be more proactive in these international standards uh, entities, provide leadership, ensure a level playing field, and help secure the software supply chain. And with that, I think we've gotten through with enough time for five or seven minutes of questions. And I've, we've got a roving microphone and we've got stickers. <laughs> Krab, you want to prime the pump with a softball? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh... Let's say I work for an organization that might use open source. How can I potentially either kind of monitor what's going on with open source and these standards, or how could I potentially uh, contribute to these efforts? Maybe, you know, how, how could I donate my time or resources or efforts to make this better? Go I'll take a first swing at that. Um, I bet there's this uh, US-based chip manufacturer that's got a great website <laughs> that uh, Intel might have a lot of information similar to what IBM sharing up here about creating a community around uh, cybersecurity. But uh, in addition to that, uh, everyone needs to just step back and think about this space differently. Because uh, there's a concept that was early in open source called the tragedy of the commons. And it's a metaphor about how when something belongs to everyone, it gets overused, trashed, and ultimately becomes a fraction of its former self. And honestly, with our rush to embrace the value of open source over the last decade and the way that cloud platforms have you know, driven up exponentially the consumption of open source, the industry hasn't been doing enough, a good enough job, IBM included, of maintaining that right balance, right? When I talk publicly about open source at IBM, I really, you know, my chest puffs up a little bit because I like to say I stand on the shoulders of giants. In the early days of open source, IBM leadership really understood the importance of both responsible contributions as well as consumption. And we all need to think about what is the right balance for us as individuals, as well as the organizations we work for. How do we strike that right balance of benefiting from and consuming open source, as well as contributing back to make sure that it's a quality resource that will be there, not just now or next year, but for the foreseeable future? And to follow up, I mean, on a practical level, right, uh, my recommendation would be for organizations that use open source is to look at the open source they're actually using 
and see if they can engage with those open source. Do they have best practices? You know, are they using best practices? So for instance, I'll give an example, very personal. I'm also involved in Hyperledger, which is another Linux Foundation project. And you think, you know, security is a big deal for blockchain. And when I started engaging OpenSSF and I found the best practices and things like vulnerability disclosures and stuff like this, I looked and I said, I'm not sure Hyperledger is really you know, up to notch on this one. And I started bringing that up. And I'm also a member of the technical steering committee of Hyperledger or technical o ob uh, oversight committee now it's called. And, and I brought that up. And I think this is the kind of, so now the Hyperledger is looking very closely at this and trying to improve its security posture. And this is something that's fairly simple that any organization can do is you, you look at the, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way self-serving as well because you look at the open source they actually depend on and you say, okay, what can I do? And it can just be this, being the advocate for this improvement in security posture, trying to you know, make sure that people who are actually developing the software that you use are aware of this movement because OpenSSF alone cannot reach out to all the different communities, all the different projects out there. So we in the industry can all play a role in passing around the world that there is something that needs to be done. And I'll provide one additional answer to that. With a quick show of hands, how many had their holiday disrupted about 14, 15 months ago by Log4j? Raise your hand. About half the room raised their hands. The other half didn't want to admit it. But I know that uh, Krob, for example, as well as a, a number of folks at Intel and IBM and other places, spent a lot of time scrambling. And it isn't a question of if another log4j will happen. It's a matter of when. So the impetus to take action is now. It's not going to be a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. But if we all collectively work at it like we like to do in open source, and again, reach out to standards organizations and engage with them effectively, uh, we can start to move the ball down the field. Okay, we have another yeah. question. And I'm Hassan Yasser from Carnegie Mellon University and also faculty member and so director at the research pieces. I have been contributing many uh, standardization, IEEE, open group, anything else. We have a lot of standards, but you said that one is the best practice. I think as a community, we have to think about a best practice. So what that means best practice, because best practice depends on who you're asking, depends on who are the standards owners. What do you think about that the landscape have many standards, but lack of best practices, it's your talk. Well, the old punchline comes to mind of, I love standards, because there's so many to choose from. But beyond that, um, it is a big challenge. I mean, if you look at my slides again upon review, you'll see many, many entities identified. We can't all be everywhere at once. So it really comes back to um, making sure that all of us have limited resources. What's most important to your organization and you as a developer? And where are you going to make some investments, right? Because the answer can't be, oh, this is overwhelming, I'm gonna just you know, not participate. And that's my high level answer. I'll ask if you have any other thoughts on no, that. No, but I was gonna say something similar. I mean, yes, there are many, and it, 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 pick anyone is better than doing nothing, right? But the complexity is a lot. I mean, when I say complex, if you look at any standards, more than 30 pages, 50 pages, you think that developer has a time to read the 50, 30 pages of report? I, we feel Zero. your pain because that's one of the things we try to message back to the um, federal government as well as other standards organization, right? Um, simplification is needed. Yes, thank you. Uh, we, the, the correct response of something like this call to action around open source shouldn't be that yesterday we had to read 400 pages of directives and now we have to read 600. So uh, we're also trying to work through IBM's GRA or Government and Regulatory Affairs Group 
to politely but strongly message back to standards organizations and governments that simplification and clarity of direction so that you don't have one part of government saying, oh, I own this and I say X, and another part of the same umbrella government organization saying, well, I have a stake in this and I say Y. So it's not, it, you know, there are going to be hills and speed bumps along it's the way. It's going to be challenging. I like that heavy simplification. Like usually developing is still 10 steps, five steps, whatever the steps are. We can bring the level of developers and say, here is use a 10 step as an example. And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an honest answer again from an IBM perspective, right? Because we're trying to solve three tough challenges simultaneously. IBM is working hard to improve its own supply chain security internally. And we're doing that with a mix of both third party uh, products as well as IBM technology so that we can drink our own champagne. Because customers come to us quite often and say, man, IBM, I, I've got this headache. You know, you must have had to fix this. What are you doing? In addition to those two challenges, we're working out here in the open SSF. Because what happens in the open ecosystem will be highly influential. And if we just hunker down and focus only on those two tough initial challenges and don't actively participate like Arno, myself, and others are doing, what happens out here could have a big impact and uh, put us you know, behind the curve. But I think you know, part of the problem, solution to the problem is also going to be tools that help you know, alleviate some of these uh, you know, excruciating uh, work. And, and we have also systems like Salsa, and there's already a badging mechanism uh, that exists in OpenSSF. Salsa, in a way, provides a new type of badging that will, you know, uh, kind of allow us to identify quickly, okay, this build system is Salsa level three. And that comes, you know, with a set of guarantees that you can rely on. And I think we're going to have more of that that will help us, you know, so we don't have to get buried into all the details. The requirements are at a much higher level that simplifies things. And again, just total candor, and we've got one last question coming up, is that right now we're doing uh, a lot of this SBOM generation in part manually because the quality of the tools available isn't there yet. But ultimately, we have to find a way to crawl, walk, run towards a level of automation because this, the scope of this problem is such that it really is going to require you know, better tools and automation. I have a question. My question is, can I get a sticker? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> On that? Right. No, no, no. I, I, I'm doing a very question. Could you scroll back and show us the tools page and so we could take a photo of the URL? Uh, is it 35? Yeah, it's 35. So with the SBOM utility, when you click on that, where does it go? Oh, the, uh, the uh, go to OWASP. Yeah, it's actually, this is the original, but it's being contributed to OWASP now. So you can go directly to OWASP. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and in closing, I, I'd like to really thank my uh, colleague, esteemed colleague Arno, because I submitted this talk with another IBM colleague based out of Germany. He was not able to uh, uh, arrange his calendar to attend. So Arno uh, jumped in, and you know, with his accent, he most uh, expertly covered the European landscape much better. Exactly. So thank you all, and I thank you, Arno. Hey, thank you for being here.